Okay, this video is going to be the first in a series of um, learning about parallel forces. We've been talking about concurrent forces, forces that are all working on the exact same point. But now we want to talk about parallel forces. So these forces might work on the same object, but maybe different parts of the object, and they could be parallel to each other. So what I'm going to draw here is a, uh, um, a bar. Let's draw a bar here, some rigid bar made of maybe wood or something, like so. And uh, we'll divide it up. We'll divide it up into, um, let's see, we'll say six, six pieces. So uh, let's see, one, two, th three, four, five, six. So we'll say each of these is a meter long or a foot long. It doesn't really matter. Just It's a six unit long um, kind of a bar. And uh, what we're going to say is that this is a uniform bar. And what a uniform bar means, that's very important, a uniform, a uniform bar means that the mass of this bar, the weight of this bar, is all distributed evenly in, in the bar. So it would be like a meter stick or something like that, that that is all uniform mass all the way through. We can have non-uniform bars where um, you know one end of it might be made of metal and the other end is made of wood or something so that the, so that the weight of there, – there might be more weight on one end of the bar than there is on the other. This is a uniform bar, and when, whenever we have a bar that has a weight, we can draw one vector that represents the weight of that bar. But the, the place that you put that weight vector is going to be important. It's going gonna, it's gonna to depend on whether it's uniform or non-uniform. If it's uniform all the way across, that means we're going to put the weight of this bar right in the center, and that will represent the weight of the whole bar. If this was a non-uniform bar, and maybe the right side is a little more heavy, um, then we would have to put the the weight of the vector somewhere further over towards that. We call that the um, that position uh, the COG or the COM, which stands for the center of gravity or the center of mass. And if it's a uniform bar, the center of mass or the center of gravity is actually in the middle of of the bar. So let's say that this bar has a weight of 20 newtons. And so we're going to draw a vector on this bar down of, of 20 newtons there. And uh, um, let's say that there's also a, uh, um, let's say that there's a, this bar is being suspended here by uh, some kind of a string or something that's holding it up here. And it is 30 newtons. Okay, so uh, you'll notice here that there's two forces on this bar, and they're not concurrent. They're not working on the exact same point. They're working on the same object, but they're working at different points on the same object. You'll notice also that they are parallel forces. So this is a, this is a parallel force problem. And what we want to try to do here is we want to figure out um, what other force should I add to this system? What's the magnitude? And uh, is it going up or down? And where should I place the force so that this object is in what we call equilibrium, which means it's not going to accelerate in any direction, but also it's not going to rotate. You'll notice right now in this position, I think you can imagine that this 20 Newton pulling this way and the 30 Newton pulling up this way is going to make this thing, um, you know, will make this thing kind of, rotate around around like this and uh, you know we don't want it we don't want it to do that so we want to try to have this whole thing uh, you know be in be in equilibrium okay um, so for parallel force problems and these are fairly easy once you get the hang of it but at the beginning it can be a little confusing I'm gonna come up with I'm gonna have three laws we'll call them the Newton or uh, Herman's three laws. Uh, number one, ups need to equal downs. So all up forces need to equal all down forces. So that's going to help us kind of figure out what force we need to put on here. And so we make little charts of these things, ups and downs. And then Herman's law number two is lefts equal rights. 
Now this isn't going to actually come into play in this particular problem because we have no forces pulling left or pulling right. But later on we're going to get to some little more complicated parallel force problems and that's going to come into play. The third one is clockwise torques equals counterclockwise torques. I'll spell that for you. Torques. And torques are... Um, the way we calculate torques is we calculate forces times the distance out to where that force is being applied. We usually call this distance the torque arm. And that from that means we need to just pick a point. We're going to pick any point on an object, and it doesn't really even matter. You can pick any point you want to on an object as long as you know the distances from it. And then measure out to the forces at times the distance that you went to the force, and that's going to be a torque, and then you're going to tell me if that's a clockwise or a counterclockwise torque, basically, which means the force is causing it to spin which way. So we'll, we'll get to that in a second here, and hopefully that'll make a little bit more sense. So we want to figure out in this problem, where should I put a force? What is the magnitude of the force? Um, is, should it go up or down? And um, where should it be applied so that this thing will not rotate? Well, this, is, this starts out pretty easy. It really does. So we have, if we look at our ups and downs first, rule number one, our ups should equal our downs. So I'm going to make a little T-chart here, ups and downs. And you'll see on here right now I have a 20 Newton down force. So I'll put that in the down column. I have a 30 Newton up force. Now we want this thing to be in equilibrium, and which means my up column, my down column need to be equal. So you clearly see that the up column is more than the down column right now. So that means I need 10 newtons down. So I know right now the magnitude of the force that I need to put on here. I need to put a 10 newton down force on there. I figured out two things. I know it's 10 newtons, and I know it needs to be going down. I need to draw that down. Now the key is, where should I put it? Because if I put it over here... Is that going to cause things to not rotate, or where, where should it go? So I can, th that, the way to figure that out is I'm going to go to my torques now, clockwise torques or counterclockwise torques. I can pick any point on here that I want to measure from. And so let's just uh, randomly choose. Um, let's just choose this point right here for the time, for the time being. Let's see here. I'm going to do this a little bit differently so we can... Get it figured out here. Okay. So, yeah, we're going to choose uh, this point right here. Okay, and this is going to be our pivot point or our measuring point. It, I just randomly chose that point. That's this. I could choose anywhere, and we're going to choose some other points later to just show that it does work out no matter what. But I'm going to pick a point on here. I'm going to pick this point right here. And I'm going to figure out my uh, clockwise torques, my clockwise torques, and my counterclockwise torques. And hopefully you'll see what I mean by that. So how do you figure out torques? Torques are forces times the torque arm or the distance to the force from my measuring point. So I, here's my measuring point. And you'll see I have two forces that I see out here. I have a 20 Newton force, which is 2 meters or 2 feet away. And I have a 30 Newton force, which is 1, 2, 3 feet away. So... This 20 Newton force, I need to think about that. 20 times 2 is 40 Newton meters or Newton feet. Either way you want it, doesn't matter. So 1, 2 times 20, 40 Newton feet. And I need to decide, is this force here going to cause this object to uh, rotate? Or which way is this force here going to cause this object to rotate around the point that I've chosen, which is right here? And you'll see that if I pull, if I keep this perfectly still right here, my pivot point, and I have this 20 newton force pulling, it's going to cause this object to rotate around, um, around this way. That is clockwise. Okay. So under my clockwise, I'm going to put 20 times 2. I'm going to put 40 um, newton feet. Okay. Now what about this one? Well. Now I go 1, 2, 3. 3 times 30 is 90 newton feet. And this one's going up, so it's going to cause this object to rotate around the opposite way, around this way. This whole object's going to rotate around this way, around my pivot point. That's counterclockwise. So under counterclockwise, I'm going to put 
90 newton feet. And those are the only two forces that you see on there. Now these need to be in equilibrium if I want this thing to not be rotating. And so that means that I need I need some more clockwise torque and I need 50 newton feet of clockwise torque. Now I know from my ups and downs that I need to put on a down force of 10 newtons. Now that's good because if I put a 10 newton down force anywhere out here, that's going to be causing it to rotate around clockwise. And that's what I need. I need 50 newton feet of clockwise torque. So where should I put the 10 newton force out here so that it will provide me 50 newton feet of clockwise torque? Well, I should put the 10 newtons five feet away. One, two, three, four, five. Right here is where I'm going to hang a 10 newton force. Because if I do that, I have 10 and 20 is 30 newtons down and 30 newtons up. My ups would be equal to my downs. My lefts are equal to my rights because there are no lefts and rights on here. And you'll see now that I have one, two, three, four, five times 10 is 50 newton feet of torque that I'm going to add on to the 1, 2 times 20, 40 newton feet, which will equal 90 newton feet of uh, counterclockwise torque. So my torques are all going to be balanced out here, and I know that I need to put that 10 newton force right there at that, at that point. Okay, let's say now, let's go ahead and say, what if I chose some other place? What if I chose um, some completely other place? Let's see. How do I want to do this? Okay. Let's, there we go. Okay, let's say that we chose... Um, um, let's say that we chose this place here. Okay. So I have clockwise and I have counterclockwise. Okay, so I'm going to measure uh, one unit over times 30. That's 30 newton meter, newton feet. 30 newton feet of what? Well, that would be going around this way. So that's clockwise. So under clockwise, I'd put 30 newton feet. And then I have one, two times 20 would be 40 newton feet of, let's see, that's going to go around that way. It's going to be counterclockwise, 40 newton feet of counterclockwise, which means I need how much? I need 10 newton feet of clockwise torque. I know I need to put a 10 newton force on here and it needs to go clockwise which means um, it needs to, I can't put the 10 newton down force out here because that would up spin it around this way counterclockwise. The only place I can go is over on the right of this uh, reference point so that means I'm going to have to put a 10 newton force right here. 10 times 1 would be 10 newton meters of clockwise torque which would give me 10 right there, and that would be equal then. And you'll see that it's exactly the same place. Well, see, it didn't matter where I measured from. Let's look at one more example, because you might be saying, what if you happen to choose this place right here as your reference point? Because we know from our first two problems that that's where the 10 Newton force ends up going. What if I accidentally chose that spot? What would happen? Well, let's try it clockwise counterclockwise, I know I need to put a 10 newton force on here somewhere. I know I need to do that. And I'm trying to figure out where. Let's say I randomly, accidentally chose the exact spot where the 10 newton force goes. Okay, so I have 1, 2 times 30 is 60, um, and that's clockwise. So I'd have 60 newton feet of clockwise. And then 1, 2, 3, 3 times 20 is 60, and that'd go around this way, 60 of counterclockwise. And for a minute, you might think, oh, what are we going to do? Where does this 10 newton force go? Because my torques are already equal. Well, if they're already equal, then that tells you exactly where the 10 newton force needs to go. It needs to go right where you happen to choose as your reference point. Because what kind of torque does this 10 newton force apply at this point? Well, you can say it's counterclockwise or clockwise. I don't care. But if you take your 10 times how far out is this? Well, it's zero. It's not any distance away from where it, the reference point is. So this force is not applying any torque because it's not, it's not away from where your pivot point is. So if I happen to get my torques that come out equal as, as it is already, then I know that the reference point is exactly where that unknown force needs to go. Now that's kind of important because that means that if I choose some 
place on here and I choose a, a, a place as my reference point where there is already a force, I don't have to worry about that force. That'll be very important here when we get to some more problems. For instance, if we just look at this again, let's say we chose this place as your reference point. Clockwise, counterclockwise. Okay, so I would measure 1 times 20, and that would be a clockwise, so 20 clockwise. And then what about this 30? Well, it it's times 0. It's not anywhere away from this reference point, so there would be... This is all I have. So I can simplify the problem by choosing one of these forces as my reference point because then I don't have to do as much math. So that means I need 20 newton feet of counterclockwise torque. And I know the 10 newton force goes down. So if I want to put a down force on here and I want a counterclockwise torque, I can't put it over here because that would make it go clockwise. It has to go over here somewhere. And how far away should a 10 newton force go to give me 20 newton meters of counterclockwise? It should go one two away. So I would have to put my 10 newtons right here. 10 times 2 would be 20 counterclockwise. And every single time I can find exactly where my force needs to go. It doesn't matter where I measure from. So hopefully that's a good introduction, part one of parallel forces. And I think there'll probably be about four parts to this so that we can definitely understand parallel forces.